Hi friends, uh, it was good on Sunday just to spend that time building our community and encouraging each other and hearing each other's stories and testimonies, but I, I did want to just give us some teaching available as we continue to walk through the Sermon on the Mount. So something for you to think about and digest over the course of this week. We are in the Gospel of Matthew and we're reading in Matthew chapter 6 now. A lot of commentators mention that at this point, Jesus begins to, to start a next section, another section of the Sermon on the Mount as he begins to teach. And it, he goes, he, this is what he says. He says, Be careful that you don't practice your religion in front of people to draw their attention. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Whenever you give to the poor, don't blow your trumpet as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets so that they may get praise from people. I assure you, that's the only reward they will get. But when you give to the poor, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that you may give to the poor in secret. Your Father who sees what you do in secret will reward you. So one of the first words that I just want us to note in this text is this, don't practice your religion in front of people. The other word sometimes is piety or your good deeds. As it's, now, one of the things that's really interesting is that Jesus says, don't practice your religion or your good deeds in front of people. But if you just flip back to Matthew 5, chapter 20, he uses the same word there. He says, in the same way, let your light shine before people so that they will see the good things you do. That's the same word as religion here. And praise your Father who is in heaven. So very interesting that the same word, religion, piety, righteousness, is getting used. And it's this invitation on one hand to let the world see your good deeds and your religion. But on the other hand is a warning in which it says, don't practice that religion, don't practice your piety in a way that everybody around you can be seen. Be careful how you practice your justice, your righteousness, your faithfulness. Why? Well, one of the things that is helpful for us to remember is what we get wrong about the Pharisees. So one thing that is important for us to remember about the Pharisees is that the Pharisees didn't have uh, intrinsic power. The Pharisees were not people who were forcing all of the, the common people to follow their way of religion or to follow in their steps. That rather, the Pharisees were the people, the followers of God, who the people revered. They are the ones, the Pharisees, were the ones who won the popular opinion about what God wants and how to live in God's way. The Pharisees were not, like as often in my imagination, the Taliban, forcing people unwilling to, unwillingly to follow their particular interpretation of religion. That's exactly the wrong view of who the Pharisees were. The Pharisees were honored by the people as those who practiced and showed their religion well. They were honored by the people for their righteousness and their holy living, and they were honored for this. And so then Jesus says, make sure that you don't practice your religion in front of people like the Pharisees so that everybody looks at you and says, well, aren't you the holy one? Aren't you so great? These religious people that you admire, Jesus seems to be saying, those who are the absolute best at practicing their religion are actually in danger of missing out on the kingdom of God. Which leads us to a second key word that I want us to see and understand. This word hypocrites in, uh, comes from the Greek word which is used to describe people who would do drama, would perform a poetry or, or a, a drama on the streets so that people could see and, and would go in. And hypocrites was sort of like a, an actor. And Jesus is saying, look, these people that you are seeing as the pillars of justice and righteousness in your community, those who seem to be the best at practicing the movements of religion are just playing religion. They see the poor and the oppressed around them, this giving of alms, of, of justice, of, of giving money to the poor. The, the poor people in front of them are, are props. 
They are something to be used for performing your religion to the world around you. What Scott McKnight says about this passage is that this passage forces the Bible's behaviors through the sieve of motivation. And Jesus says the Pharisees who are out there practicing their religion in front of people are using the poor as their prop, as they perform their good deeds. And so the thing for us to remember is that the world is not your stage. When we look at the world, when we look at those around us, who are we performing for? Who is it that we hope will applaud our good deeds and our righteousness, our justice, our piety? Who do we practice our religion for? Is it for those who need it? Or is it for the applause of those around us? Eugene Peterson translates 6 verse 1 this way, Be especially careful when you are trying to be good so that you don't make a performance out of it. It might be good theater, but God who made you won't be applauding. John Calvin, the um, theologian, he, he said that the, the theater of God is the hidden corners. The Pharisees were making the theater of God to be the streets, the public places where everybody could see their religion and their good deeds. And Calvin says, no, no, no. If you want to perform for God, it will be in the hidden corners where people cannot see. If you want to perform your religion, your piety, your justice in a way that delights God, it must be done in a way that makes God the audience, not those who are watching. And so Matthew 25 verse 31 is perhaps one of the best commentaries on this passage. And in this passage, Jesus is talking to those who were out and around in the air, um, who, as he separates and he's judging the sheep and the goats. And so Matthew 25, verse 31, the judgment of the nations, and, and God separates those unto his left and his right. And then verse 34 says, Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who will receive good things from my father, inherit the kingdom that was prepared for you before the world began. I was hungry and you gave me food to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you, you gave me clothes to wear. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. And then those who are righteous, who are just, will reply to him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you a drink? When did we see you as a stranger and welcome you or naked and give you clothes to wear? When did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will reply, I assure you that when you have done it for one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you have done it for me. They didn't even know that they were caring for Christ. It was so hidden left hand to right hand. They were simply doing what was right. So one of the warnings that comes is that in our justice, our giving to the poor, one of the dangers is that our justice, our charity, our piety can actually buy the poor. The danger of making our justice public is that we invite the poor to become just a prop just a tool for us to feel good. And so Simone Weil was a French mystic and philosopher in the early 1900s. She was a fascinating woman who lived in solidarity with the poor and the oppressed in France. Uh, she had a great personal and physical to toll on her body as well. She sought to identify with the suffering of Christ and the suffering of the poor. And so she wrote this about almsgiving. She said, Almsgiving, when it is not supernatural, is like a sort of purchase. It buys the sufferer. What she means is that when we are giving to the needy, when it is not motivated by justice, by the supernatural 
filling of God so that we seek to even out the balance between the giver and the receiver. It is simply another form of transaction. Our justice becomes cheapened and commercial. Those with power and wealth buy the gratitude of the poor and receive the praise of those assembled. Don't blow your trumpet on the street so that everybody can see your justice. Because then you are just simply buying the oppressed. You are not doing justice. To give in secret, filled with the Spirit of God, brings justice. It means that we seek not just to give to the poor, but to listen to them, to offer compassion. Instead of using the poor as our prop, we give in a way that brings us into connection and relationship with those in need. The ultimate command of Jesus is to love your neighbor as yourself. I think that fits very well because love is not abstract. Love is not distant. We cannot so simply make love into, um, we cannot just love an idea. Love actually moves us into relationship and into connection with people. And in this passage in Matthew, what I hear Jesus saying is, when you are giving, do it in a way that brings love and equality and balance and true justice with those whom you give. The final thing that occurs to me, though, is this piety and giving in public. And it's challenging because Jesus does not literally mean not to give in public or, as the next section says, only to pray in your closet. Obviously, we are supposed to do these things in a way that get, brings God glory, like Matthew 5 said. And so Matthew 5, 16, I already read it. Let's just see it again. It says, In the same way, let your light shine before people so that they can see the good things you do and praise your Father who is in heaven. One of the obvious dangers about never letting the left hand know what the right hand is doing is that sometimes we give so well and so secretly that we fail to pass on to the next generation the importance of giving and generosity. Uh, how do we teach our children the importance of giving if we never talk to them about where our money goes and how we're doing it? And so Jesus is not saying don't do any good deeds out in public. Our good deeds, our acts of justice, should be seen. That's actually clear. But the world is not your stage. The world is not your stage. And so look at these two passages side by side, Matthew 5, 16 and 6, verse 2. What you see is that in both of these passages, there is an element of praise. But what the next piece you see is simply this, that one person gives in a way in which the praise goes to the Father. The other gives in such a way that the praise comes from people. The hypocrites, the actors, those who are giving on the street and blowing their trumpets so that everybody will see what they are doing, are looking for the praise of people. And when they receive the praise of people, Jesus says, that is all the reward you will get. Where there are other people who give in a way that when people see the good deeds, these acts of justice, the care for the poor, what they see is a God worthy of praise. And the Father receives the praise. The hypocrite is one who can be so self-deceived that they think that they are practicing their religion well, but they are missing the point. The point is simple. Do justice. Care for the poor, the oppressed, the widow, the orphan, the refugee, the marginalized, in such a way that it elevates their humanity and does not <laughs> seek the praise of the crowd, but rather gives glory to God. This text pushes everything through the sieve of motivation and invites us to ask, who are we really? Are we actors seeking praise from others and using our privilege and our wealth to make ourselves look good? Or are we seeking genuine, genuinely to do justice, to help those in need, without making a scene and in a, in a way that invites people to praise the Father and not us? Challenging words, for sure. 
So let us ponder them and do justice and love mercy in ways that don't make us the, <laughs> the main actors and make the world our stage, but rather in a way that is silent, beautiful, and leads to the praise of our Heavenly Father. Amen.